Good morning conference organisers, thank you for having me here today. My name is James Ivory and today I'll be presenting my critique on the international response to the 2002 SARS pandemic. The outline of the presentation today will include a background to the SARS pandemic. This will include an overview of the disease, how the outbreak of the SARS started and having a One Health perspective on SARS. I'll also include how the SARS had an impact on the international health regulations. I'll then explain the aim of the presentation. I'll give my method on how I've obtained literature for the presentation and I'll give my critique to the SARS pandemic followed by recommendations for future response processes to what can be implemented to avoid future pandemics of similar nature. I'll give you a brief overview of the disease itself. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, causes a rapid fatal infection of the lungs caused by the SARS coronavirus. The mode of transmission for this infection is via respiratory droplets. However, the, this disease can, disease can become airborne through certain procedures in healthcare, such as use of nebulizers, high flow nasal prongs, invasive ventilation and non-invasive ventilation. The other transmission is the fecal oral route, as this virus can be present in stools. This virus can also be spread as a fomite. A fomite is a virus that is left on a surface which can be spread by people touching that surface which has a fomite left on it. The incubation period for this disease is approximately 4.6 days and the major symptoms of this disease include fever, rigors, chills, myalgia, a dry cough, lethargy, dyspnea and a headache. Less common symptoms were a sore throat, sputum production, a runny nose, nausea, vomiting and dizziness. As a result of these symptoms can then progress to pneumonia which can result in death as a person can die from either respiratory, cardiac or liver failure. So how did the SARS outbreak start? The SARS outbreak originated in China's southern province Guangdong in November 2002. It was first reported as an atypical pneumonia. This atypical pneumonia had then spread to Hong Kong Due to this atypical pneumonia, it led to an outbreak due to the transmission of the disease being superseded globally by air travel from Hong Kong. This atypical pneumonia then raised the World Health Organization's attention, which led them to developing a task force of laboratories around the world where they were able to identify that the SARS coronavirus was a causative agent behind the atypical pneumonia. As a, re as a result of SARS, it had spread to 29 countries where it infected 8,096 people. Among the 8,096 people, it caused 774 fatalities due to the severe pneumonia caused by SARS. First of all, I'd like to explain what a One Health approach is. A One Health approach aims at integrating multidisciplinary evidence and knowledge which coordinates interventions to create a worldwide synergism catering for all aspects of healthcare for humans, their animal and their environment. From a One Health approach, SARS is a zoonotic disease. Scientists have discovered that the horseshoe bat in China was the original reservoir of SARS. The horseshoe bat then would have passed it on to the masked palm civet, which were being sold in the animal markets in Guangdong, China for human consumption. This is the origin of how this atypical pneumonia started in the southern province of China. The SARS pandemic was declared over in 2004 when no further infections were reported. So what is the international health regulations? The IHR was first introduced in 1969 as global legislation that mandates countries to link and coordinate specific actions on infectious diseases. The regulations were originally designed to control the plague, cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, typhus and relapsing fever. As a result of the outcome of the SARS pandemic was a wake up call to the WHO for reforming the IHR in 2005. The WHO led the reform of the IHR as a result of China's two month delay in notifying the WHO of the outbreak of the atypical pneumonia. Furthermore, it took two months for China to allow the WHO's epidemiologists to enter Guangdong. The WHO's director general at the time criticized China's delay in communication. This led, led to a major political shift towards reforming worldwide prompting, reporting and transparency, which pushed the reforming the IHR. 
The WHO's improved version of the IHR focuses on strengthening the international process for the avoidance, protection and control of globally spread infectious diseases. The IHR are crucial as the world we live in today is in interconnected due to the globalization, which gives numerous of opportunities for infectious diseases to spread quickly. The aim of this presentation is to critique the international response to the 2002 SARS pandemic. Key aspects that will be critiqued will include the collaboration of the international scientific community, the travel guidelines, the level of reporting, and the standard of infection control process, process within healthcare. The method conducted for the abstract in this, in this presentation was performed by performing a search on the following topic, the SARS pandemic. The following databases acts to a SINAL, MEDLINE and ProQuest. Keywords used with a date range between 2003 and 2020 included SARS, International Health Regulations, One Health and Response. This search method allowed me to retrieve data rich information from the literature in order for me to perform my critique and gather information for future response mechanisms to pandemics. The first aspect of the critique I'd like to comment on is the collaboration of the international scientific community. The WHO implemented an international response to SARS by utilizing the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, GUAN, which established a network of 11 leading infectious disease laboratories in nine countries. Within two weeks, the laboratories across the world identified SARS coronavirus as a causative agent to the atypical pneumonia. These laboratories were normally competitors when it comes to research but they're able to put their differences aside and work together and freely share information that led to finding the cause of the atypical pneumonia. This collaboration within the scientific community needs to continue as greater cooperation will assist with threats from new, newly emerging infectious diseases. The next, next aspect of this critique is regarding the use of travel recommendations during the pandemic. Advice to postpone non-essential travel by the WHO and various governments was crucial during the SARS pandemic. 15 days since the WHO were notified of a new atypical pneumonia, the WHO issued a series of travel advisories to postpone non-essential travel to SARS affected areas, which limited the spread of infection by international travel. Measures such as providing alert information to entering and exiting travelers signs, videos, public address announcements, health alert notices, thermal scanning and visual inspection to detect symptoms. As a result of the WHO in the early stage of the outbreak, issuing travel alerts and travel advisories has been linked to a successful global public health initiative in containing the outbreak. As this new disease wasn't responding to antiviral treatments and there were no vaccines available, the best way to combat SARS was through the traditional use of using traditional public health interventions. These were implemented by international organizations, national governments and public health authorities. These interventions involved early case detection, case isolation, tracing and quarantining of contacts, strict infection control and decreasing social interactions and keeping the public informed. Although these interventions are based off a 19th century public health tool, they were successful in containing SARS. The aspect that I'd like to critique that didn't go well during the pandemic is the level of reporting. SARS first emerged in November, China, 2002. China delayed reporting the outbreak of this atypical pneumonia to the WHO until February, 2003. Extensive criticism was placed on China for its failure to share information about the emerging atypical pneumonia early in the outbreak. If information was shared in a timely manner, it would have allowed countries to prepare and respond early in the pandemic. Due to China's inadequate surveillance and response capacity, not only endangered their own population, but posed a breach in global health security. As a result of the poor reporting of this pandemic had a roll on effect towards infection control in healthcare settings. The SARS outbreak had shown what happens to countries when they're not prepared for newly emerging infectious diseases. The transmission of SARS within healthcare facilities were predominantly seen in China, Hong Kong, Singapore and Canada. The SARS pandemic exposed weaknesses in infection control processes. Approximately 21% of people infected with SARS were healthcare workers, 
risk of transmission was 12.6 times higher than those healthcare workers who did not wear masks. Other risk factors included contact with respiratory secretions and exposure of body fluids with mucous membranes, performing aerolizing procedures, which is ventilation, chest physio, and suctioning. Inadequate patient placement in isolation rooms was another risk factor. Evidence-based guidance that I would like to provide in what we can do to prevent future pandemics is by implementing the One Health approach. There is an urgent need for the application of a multidisciplinary One Health approach that needs to address dynamic health challenges on the animal to human environmental level. SARS is a One Health concern due to the SARS coronavirus being a zoonotic disease. We need to implement a One Health approach in the animal markets in China. These measures will include collaborative interdisciplinary control between the public health sectors in agriculture, biosurveillance of live animal markets and animal, tr animal transportation, and also educating the public on zoonotic diseases. My first recommendation for the response relates to the reporting of the pandemic. Countries need to report swiftly and transparently of any infectious disease that has potential to spread. This recommendation is also legislated with the IHR as its framework makes reporting and risk assessments for public health emergencies of international concern mandatory. It's crucial that we report any disease that has the potential to spread internationally. My other recommendation is that we employ risk communication strategies for future pandemics. Risk communication is integral to any public health emergency response. Further risk communication is one of the IHR core capacity components. Risk communication is a real-time exchange of information, opinions and advice between officials or experts and people who face a threat to their survival, health or, or economic well-being. Effective risk communication early into the outbreak identifies and manages rumours, misinformation and other communication strategies. My recommendation for infection control practices in healthcare will be implementing evidence-based strategies which will include hospitals to ma make sure they have staff with epidemiological skills at the ready, as this will help with contact tracing and controlling the outbreak. Avoiding overcrowding in emergency departments. Having contingency plans in place for isolating large cohorts of potentially infected people. Ensuring hospitals have a sustained surge capacity symptoms and placing patients of unknown infectious diseases into single rooms. Limiting exposure with aerialization procedures and make sure we're using our PPE, gown, masks, goggles and gloves. Ensuring staff are up to date with their vaccine schedule. Overall, improving infection control procedures in healthcare will have a bigger effect on reducing new outbreaks in healthcare, which have positive outcomes for the patients and staff and community. The, two, the 2002 SARS pandemic was of international concern due to how quickly it had spread and the amount of people it infected and killed. From a One Health perspective, SARS was a zoonotic disease due to being transmitted from the horseshoe bat which spread to the animal markets via the masked palm civet. The positive aspects of the critique revealed that there was a strong presence of the international scientific community collaborating together to discover the cause of the atypical pneumonia. Public health and interventions were highly effective in containing and eradicating, eradicating the SARS disease, and travel recommendations and advisories were beneficial in reducing the spread of the disease around the world. Areas which need improvement is the level of reporting of the disease and that a pandemic can reveal how vulnerable healthcare workers can be if there are weaknesses in our infection control processes in healthcare. Recommendations were made in relation to any WHO member state needs to report promptly and transparently if there is any public health emergency of international concern. We need to incorporate risk communication to inform the public of pandemics and keep them informed of factual information. Ensuring our healthcare infection control processes are up to date and ready to combat any newly emerging outbreaks. And lastly, implementing a One Health approach for the guidance of SARS is crucial, as we need to decrease the risk of newly emerging zoonotic diseases. This is through bio surveillance in animal markets around the world, collaboration between agriculture and public health sectors around the world in countries, and educating the public about zoonotic diseases. Thank you for your time, for hearing my critique on the international response to the SARS pandemic, and I look forward to hearing your feedback.